children surprise us all the time. And one of my, the first stories I heard when I arrived here as, as the new pastor was from the school. And uh, it was a second grade girl who was going to her first confession. And as she comes out of her first confession, the poor girl is sobbing. And her, she comes to her teacher and her teacher says, what's wrong, honey? And she says, father gave me this really hard penance. And the teacher says, really? And the little girl says, yes. He said, I had to do three Hail Marys, but I only know one. <laughs> There's another man who recently tweeted that he, uh, he also was given a really hard penance, but he felt pretty tough. He, he was told to do a decade of the rosary, and he, had, he only has one year left. <laughs> Misunderstandings. All the time, it happens to the best of us. But kids surprise us. Kids surprise us. There's a story of a, of a family who, uh, years ago, one of the children was diagnosed with a rare blood disease, and he needed a blood transfusion. So the whole family quickly finds out who has the, the matching blood type. And the only one with the matching blood type is the youngest boy. So dad goes to his son and he says, Son, are you willing to give blood so that your brother may live? And the little boy thought about it. And he says, yes. So the next day, he's at the hospital, and the little boy's sitting on the examination table, and his feet are dangling there. And they stick the needle in his arm, start drawing blood up this tube, and he's watching the, the blood go up the tube and start filling a bag full of his blood. And as he sits there, he looks at the blood, and he looks at his dad, looks back at the blood, and he says to his dad, Hey, Dad, when will I begin to die? The little boy was told that he had to give blood, and in his little child mind, he understood that giving, losing blood is to die. And his dad asked him, and he said, sure, I'll die for my brother. Isn't that crazy? I mean, the radical love, the reckless love of a child. I love it. Children will surprise us all the time. Now, if you caught this, there's a little, a little child brought up in today's gospel. Today is the gospel of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. Five loaves, two fish, and they feed 5,000 people. But did you catch that there's a little boy involved? And he doesn't have a name because even the apostle who was writing this didn't care, didn't pay much attention to the kid. And most of us don't remember the little boy. Because remember the scene. There's Jesus, and he's come and he and his apostles, he's, as he sits down to teach, they see this huge crowd coming. And the apostles begin to panic. And Jesus says to them, we need to, we need to provide food for them. Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? And I can just imagine the apostles are thinking, like, that's not my responsibility, okay? <laughs> and so they're in a panic. Peter says, or Philip says, 200 days wages wouldn't be enough money to pay for food for all these people. 5,000 people. 200 days wages, by the way, is in today's standards over twenty to $30,000. Okay, so clearly there's just no way. But Jesus knew, it says. Jesus himself knew what he was going to do. So just imagine, there's Jesus huddled with his apostles. And then there's this little boy who overhears what's going on. And he steps forward. And the apostles, he can't quite get to Jesus, but he's got five loaves of bread and two fish. And he kind of pokes one of the apostles. And as they're all frustrated, they look at him and he says, like, See, even this boy, he's got five loaves, two fish, but what's that for 5,000 people? But Jesus receives this offering. And Jesus blesses it, breaks it, divides it up, 
And what happens here is it becomes more than enough to the point that there are leftovers. I don't know if anyone here has ever gone hungry. I know friends who did experience in, so it's like the kind of poverty where you don't have enough to eat every day. And this fr friend of mine told me that the first day we had leftovers in the, refriger, in the, in the refrigerator, um, there's this just great hope. Having leftovers means that we've got enough for tomorrow. That we have, not, we have enough for today and some. Leftovers is peace and hope. Jesus in this gospel is challenging you and I to acknowledge what we've got, but not be afraid of the inadequacy and insufficiency of who we are and what we've got, but to rather see that we, we, uh, if we submit it to God, place it under His care, He can make it so that it's more than enough. There will be leftovers. Now, I stand out in this crowd of adults, not just because of what I'm wearing, but also because I'm one of the only ones who's not married. So allow me to speak just a minute into what this gospel means for marriages. This gospel, this narrative of the multiplication of the loaves and fish, John doesn't call it a miracle. He calls it a sign. And in fact, it's a unique feature about the Gospel of John is that he doesn't refer to miracles. He refers to signs. Signs are something that point to something else. A uh, stop sign points to order, freedom from chaos. Police don't care about the redness of the sign, the strong metal and the great text on it. They care about the order and safety. It's a sign that points to something greater. There's natural signs too, like smoke in the distance. It means there's a fire. You just know that. It points to something you can't see. This sign of the multiplication of the loaves points to the kind of care God has. And in your marriage, God is working. Thus, your marriage is a sign. Marriage is a sacrament, a sacramental sign. Points to God's work. What's God's work? Well, I could go on and on about that. But let me just continue to invite you to ponder this. What if God designed marriage to make you holy, not happy? What if God designed marriage, which he did, he designed marriage, it's his thing. What if he designed it not so much to make you happy as much as to make you holy? There's a book that has that subtitle. It's a book by Gary Thomas. I've never read it, but I heard the testimony of a, of a couple this week that says that that kind of changed their whole mentality. They had been using their marriage as their prerogative. Church was over there. God was over there. And then there's their marriage. And they lived it according to their teachings and not the church's. One of those things that helped this couple, kind of a big a, a game changer for them, was a little thing called... NFP. NFP, I think, is the greatest, the best kept secret of the Catholic Church. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, there you go, there's the proof. <laughs> NFP stands for Natural Family Planning. Basically, at the end of the day, it's, it's a, a number of, there's numerous natural methods that scientists have, have discovered that help a couple know when they're fertile and unfertile. But I could go on and on about that. Um, in my life, I just want to share what this has done for my life. Not that I'm married again, but my parents were NFP teachers, and to this day they teach. They were teaching long before I was born. So uh, that means that they had books and charts all about teaching fertility and all these things to couples. And they would have couples over all the time to mentor them and to teach them the ropes and everything. And what that means for me is that by the time I was 12 years old, I knew way more about fertility than I would ever want to know in my life. Because inevitably you just stumble upon these charts and pictures and you're like, what's that? What's this? And, like, what? and it just gets crazy. It just gets crazy. So, but what living in a household that practiced NFP meant for me, what it did for me in my upbringing, 
was that I saw marriage and sexuality being practiced by my parents in a way that they submitted it to God and his teachings. They, and they would speak about sexuality, and I know that they spoke it to themselves, even though I didn't hear their conversations, but they would speak to us about sexuality as a gift from God. And thus, because it's a gift, it's something that we need to order according to his design. It's not my design, it's his design. What that meant for a little boy growing up to think that sexuality was a gift from God and it was something that he was going to teach me how to make it um, healthy and not hurtful. What that did for me was I... Uh, knew that sexuality was something that we can talk about and that it's a good thing that God can show me the way. What that does is it shatters the majority of, of shame and silence that often can surround sexuality. We don't talk about it, we're not comfortable, or we dismiss it as like, yeah, yeah, whatever, just it's, it's, it's a thing. But, but to know that it's from God and He's showing the way it shatters shame. Now, granted, I was a normal little boy, so there was still plenty of curiosities that I had that I never voiced to my parents, and there's still shame and things that I, I, I stumbled in my own life. But a whole different ball game. It, it, having a, a home where NFP was practiced did a second thing for me. I knew that my life mattered. That even to the point of conception, there was, there was a sense in my home that conception was a gift from God as well. Not something we can plan and perfectly figure out, but it is a good thing that it matters. To make my point, my parents more than once told me the story of the day I was conceived growing up. And they shared intimate details that, not what you're thinking, what they shared was that they got up that morning and went to daily Mass. And they, they prayed to God together. We know, Lord, that today we're fertile. And if you will, we can conceive a child today. And if it's your will, we will accept it with joy. That does something to a kid. God has a plan for our sexuality and for marriage. And so thus, it's, 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 it's designed for our holiness. It's not always going to make us feel great, but it's going to give us a sense that there's something higher. It points to something greater. And when it's ordered and, and used according to God's purposes, it brings life. <clears throat> I share that. Because that's one of the ways in which insecurities, inadequacy, and uh, all of the, the feeling of we're lacking what we need for a happy marriage enters. And NFP couples tend to have far lower divorce rates, and they have far healthier communication. Because too often love is just something we don't talk about, we just do. But when you talk about it, now there's, there's greater communication and freedom. Like the loaves and the fishes, if we surrender to God the things we've received from Him, no matter how small and insufficient they seem, if we submit them to Him and let Him order them, bless them, He will spread them out and there will be leftovers. And why is that? Because of love, the love that He pours into our little lives with His humility. When God the Father asked His Son Jesus, are you willing to give not just some, not just a lot, but all of your blood so that your brothers and sisters might live? He said, yes. And that life blood is poured out to us again and again on this altar. And we are invited to receive that because his, He's giving us a blood, a blood transfusion so that our little things our little human lives can bear abundance. Let's, let's enter into that mystery.